Now, when we're educating patients about prostate cancer, there's a, a lot of numbers involved. We're talking about the PSA number, the PSA velocity, the prostate volume, the PCA3 numbers, and then we start talking about the Gleason number. Tell us about the Gleason score, what does that mean, and does that only apply to patients who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, or does, where does the Gleason score come into it? So Dr. Gleason was a pathologist who found that when you examine a biopsy under the microscope, if there is cancer, the closer the tumor cells appear to be normal prostate tissue, the lower the risk that there'll be an aggressive clinical course. And he came up with a scale from two to 10. Six and lower is considered low risk, seven is intermediate, eight, nine, 10 is high risk. And the Gleason score is made up of two grades. So if you have a Gleason score six, it's typically three plus three. The Gleason score sevens, that's really what makes a huge difference because it could be a three plus four or a four plus three. And I tell patients, don't get caught up on the numbers. Look at my parking lot. Tell me what you see. And they'll say, well, mainly sedans and a couple SUVs. Those, that's how you can characterize the Gleason grade. The first number is the predominant pattern. When you look under the microscope, if you see mainly three, that's the lower risk, but you got a couple four sprinkled in there, you have intermediate risk cancer, but you're gonna do better. You're gonna act more like a six. On the other hand, if you have mainly Gleason 4 in terms of the grade, with a couple 3 sprinkled in, those will behave a little bit more like the more aggressive cancers. And in fact, we've recently um, enhanced the Gleason um, number into different categories that you know, will help the patient as well as the physician make treatment decisions. Now, when a patient comes to see you, let's say they've already had a biopsy done by their community urologist and you have the pathology report in front of you and it tells you whether they're a Gleason 6, 7, 8. Uh, do you go on what the pathologist from Hospital A says or do you ever question, well, hang on a minute, this is also a human being who's looked at this under a microscope. Do all pathologists agree that a Gleason 6 is a Gleason 6 and a Gleason 7 is a Gleason 7? At the end of the day, you're basing your treatment recommendations off of a pathology report. Is sure. that good enough? A lot of patients ask for a second read, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I think Gleason score six is so common that when you see it, you recognize it. When you get to more of the sevens and the eights, particularly if it's going to be a three plus four or four plus three, we often ask for our independent pathologist to look, take a look at it and give us another set of reading on it. That's, that's very important because we're really going to base the treatment decision on whether it's a three plus four or four plus three. Now, if there's 100 guys in the room and they're all Gleason seven, how do you pick out the sevens that are the good sevens versus the sevens that behave at the opposite end of the spectrum? Can we do any other tasks other than just looking at the pathology under the microscope to pick out the more aggressive sevens, for example, than the less aggressive sevens? Any role for molecular tests? Sure, sure. So, you know, the starting point is just looking at some of the clinical pathologic information. So we look at the PSA, you know, if it's elevated, if it's higher than four, but it's only a 4.5, that prompted the biopsy, that's different than having a PSA of 12 or 13. That might be more of a trigger to treat. You look at how much cancer is there. If it's one core of Gleason 3 plus four, you may be less inclined to treat as opposed to if you've got every biopsy throughout the prostate, 90% four plus three. That's our starting point. We get a bone scan, we get a CAT scan if they're a little bit more advanced just to make sure that we're dealing with organ-confined disease. But we now live in the era of genomics and there's, we have to understand there's a difference between genetics and genomics when we talk about studies. So genetics is really based on my family history, based on my race, what is my risk for getting the cancer? That's genetics. Genomics is different. Genomics looks at the DNA material in the actual cancer cell itself and determines will that make this cancer behave in a more aggressive way. And there are some marketed um, tools that we can now use to study genomics. So one example, and there are many, uh, one is Oncotype DX, where they look at 17 genes and give you a characterization. Is this gonna be a very low risk, low risk, or aggressive cancer? It's a great test, isn't it, for the right patient? It absolutely is. And I typically will use that to help a patient be comfortable with doing nothing. In other words, active surveillance. And that's the test that's, just to clarify for the audience, that's a test that's done on the biopsy material. It does not correct. mean that patients need to necessarily undergo a repeat biopsy. That's the that's good correct. news. That's correct. Now, whenever patients are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer and they're looking at treatment options and they go back home, start talking to friends and family, often patients come back and say, you know, well, what grade am I? What stage am I? And patients often get confused between grade of cancer 
and stage of cancer. How do we educate patients about what's the difference between grade and stage? Right, so there are three broad categories. We look at the PSA number, and PSA less than four generally is considered normal if you're very young, perhaps you want to lower than 2.5. And then we like, if, if they do have cancer, we'd like to be less than 10 and certainly less than 20. And that gives you some prognostic information. We look at the Gleason score that we've discussed, and then we look at the stage. And the stage is what we call the TNM system, where we look at can you feel a nodule in the prostate and that would make it more of a T2, as opposed to the only reason a biopsy was done was because of the elevated PSA, but the urologist feels a completely normal prostate. That would be a T1C. So the grade is talking about the aggressiveness of the cancer. Correct. The stage is telling you how far advanced the disease is, whether, whether it's confined to the prostate or whether it's spread beyond the prostate. Is it possible to have an aggressive tumor that's still confined, so you can For have sure. a high grade and a low stage? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the TNM, it looks at the actual feel of the prostate. Do you feel a nodule or not? Then the CAT scan or the MRI, did you see lymph nodes? That's the end part of it. Because we know that prostate cancer, as it advances, it eventually could spread to lymph nodes and to bone. So the N is for the lymph nodes and the M is for other sites such as bone or visceral organs. So for patients who are newly diagnosed, you've already talked about MRIs, you've talked about CAT scans. We know that we can do a bone scan because prostate cancer will often spread to the bone. Do all patients with prostate cancer need an MRI, a CAT scan, and a bone scan? Absolutely who does, not. who doesn't? Yeah, absolutely not. And, and we know that we've been over imaging. Um, so I would say that anybody with a Gleason score six cancer that has a PSA less than 10, you really don't need to image them because the likelihood of having disease in your lymph nodes or bone is less than you know 2%. So to put them through that study, I wouldn't recommend it. Now some patients insist on it anyway because they're going to lose sleep if they don't do it, but it's not good practice. And you know these days insurance companies are getting pretty sophisticated. They'll get on the phone and say, well why are you ordering this test? And you have to have a pretty good reason to order it. And I think they're right about that. We don't want to over order test. You know, there's a radiation exposure to the patient getting an unnecessary CAT scan. So it has to be a good rationale. Uh, but I think, you know, for the Gleason score 7s and certainly 8, 9, and 10, you do want to do proper imaging, which includes a CAT scan or an MRI or even a PET-CT. There's some very um, sophisticated studies that are coming out now. Yeah, I was just going to bring that point into the discussion that we've come a long way in the way that we diagnose these cancers with these molecular tests and urine markers, blood markers, but the imaging has really progressed as well in terms of the bone scans now, we don't just have the standard technetium 99 right. nuclear medicine bone scan. And now we're seeing these more and more sophisticated tests that are getting much better at picking up microscopic disease Absolutely. very early on, yes? And that makes a huge difference. You know, if a patient is contemplating having surgery to remove the prostate gland, we want to be sure that it hasn't spread to the lymph nodes or to the bone. It wouldn't make sense to operate if it had. So it's very helpful to have the sodium fluoride PET-CTs and some of the newer ones that can really help sort out which patients should be looking at surgery and which ones should be taking a different approach.